So today I've got a Q and A where I asked people on Instagram what they'd like to learn about. Questions for me personally, questions about watchmaking, questions about Weiss Watch Company, really anything. And I'm gonna go over those questions today and see if we can get some answers. So first question here we have, uh, if you didn't become a watchmaker, what do you think you would have become? Well, to be completely honest, I think I probably would have gone either into some kind of auto mechanic, auto restoration type work, or even into construction. I just absolutely love cars and I love old cars. So restoration would have been something I would have enjoyed a lot, but I also really like any kind of building projects. I do a lot of work at my own house, a lot of small construction kind of jobs and also tons of landscaping. I am a big gardener and I've done all the landscaping at, uh, at my house. And it's kind of my happy place when I'm not in my watchmaking workshop. What are the most challenging steps in order to make a fully American made watch? Now this question is a tricky one because there's a lot of challenging steps. Making a watch includes a lot of different specialties. You could be a master of turning and running CNC lathes, but that won't make a watch. You also have to either have somebody who is a master at milling to pair with that or become a master at milling yourself. You also have watchmaking. Machining parts is just one little tiny part of making a watch. So you have to have all of the watchmaking knowledge and background as well. You also have to know how to design products. You have to know how to design for manufacture. And here in the US, we don't have watch suppliers. So we can't just call up a case manufacturer and say, I want a 42 millimeter case of stainless steel and I want it to look kind of like this. That's not an option here in the US. So we really have to know a lot more about every little specialty that goes into making a watch. So in general, everything is really complex in making an American watch. However, one of the largest hurdles is in one of the smallest parts, and that's the hairspring. The hairspring of a watch is made of a special alloy that is a nickel iron alloy that is not affected by temperature. And this is the timing organ of a wristwatch. It's the spring that makes the balance wheel go back and forth and it has to keep time. It's like the pendulum of a clock, except wound up to fit inside of a wristwatch. So there's a lot of little challenges surrounding the hairspring in particular, because there's no hairspring manufacturing taking place in the US to a level that would allow for precision timekeeping. So as a watchmaker, if you want to try and make those parts in the US, you have to really go all the way back to the base alloy. And that is a very complex job to go from a spool of round wire that is not precision at all and turn it into a precise rectangular profile wire that is thinner 
than the human hair, completely flat, perfectly coiled, just the right length to pair with the weight of your balance wheel, and then to assemble it with the balance wheel. And for everything to keep time within a few seconds a day, it's a big challenge. So most of that still happens either in Switzerland or in China, where there's equipment and large scale production for these components. So another question I have here is why watchmaking? And for me, I always loved watches from a young age, but what really kind of drew me into getting deeper into watches was that mix of art, craftsmanship, high precision, and then the fact that watches don't take up a lot of space. And watchmaking tools, a watchmaking workbench, you could fit them in your bedroom, right? It's just one workbench to start working on watches. Uh, whereas cars take up a lot of space and the tools for working on cars, those take up a lot of space as well. So for me, it was those two things, this, this just love of the engineering and the, the mix of art and science, but also the fact that these are smaller items that could be carried with you. All right. And I have a question here about lubrication, which, uh, I did an episode on lubrication, which goes over a lot of the different lubrications that go into a watch. But this question, does lubrication have a shelf life or use life? Uh, for example, wrist time versus storage time. And to me, this question is asking, will the oils last longer if you're wearing your watch or if it's sitting in a drawer or a safety deposit box. And I will say the oils do have a maximum life of 10 years. So 10 years, if the watch is in a nice dry, not humid environment, no UV light getting on the, the watch oils, not a lot of heat and not really cold temperatures or temperature fluctuations, you can get 10 years from the oil. However, wristwatches almost never see conditions like that. A wristwatch gets put on your wrist. So right there, it's going to be seeing perspiration. It's going to be seeing different lotions and skincare products. It's going to be exposed to water, humidity, temperature changes when you go in and out of air conditioning or heat. And with all of that, that is going to be the number one thing that causes the oil to degrade over time. The next thing will be the parts moving. As metal parts move, wheels interact. They're going to rub on each other and you will get dust metal dust in the movement of a watch. Now it's small microscopic dust, but when you add that into the lubrication that's placed on the pivots, you end up with a somewhat abrasive powder. So on the wrist, if a watch is worn every day, usually you're going to have to service it, meaning a full cleaning and re-oiling every two to three years, if worn regularly. Now, just because a watch has dried out oil or dirty oil, that doesn't mean you have to service it immediately. If you're not using it and it's just being stored, having dry or no oil on it is not going to harm the watch. But what you don't want is to continue using a watch that has dry, dirty oil. Here we have a couple questions about Weiss Watch Company. First one here is, 
What is your long-term vision for Weiss? Go big or stay boutique? So currently, I make about 1,500 watches a year, which is teeny tiny for a watch company. The brands I worked for before starting Weiss, uh, Vacher and Constantine, we made around 20,000 watches a year. And before working with them, I worked with Audemars Piguet. They made around 30,000 watches a year. Both of those companies, their timepieces start in the $20,000 range and up. So what I do here is pretty small compared to even those brands, which are low volume watchmaking houses. If I could increase production here in the US, my ideal range would be around 10,000 to 20,000 watches a year here in the US. It's really tough to picture a world where I could make enough watches here in Nashville to really go big, or at least what I think of as big, which is thinking in terms of Rolex and Omega. Brands like that make over half a million watches a year. And doing that in the US, for one, the industry is tiny here and accomplishing that would be a massive challenge. But two, I don't necessarily know that there's a market for it. So I think that the better place to be for what I want to do, which is expose more people to mechanical watchmaking and kind of traditional watches, being small, but just large enough to take advantage of new technology like CNC machines, some automated assembly. If I could be at a level where I could take advantage of some of that technology while still using traditional watchmaking, I think that would be the ideal place so that prices could remain relatively low, but also still provide all mechanical, handmade watches. All right, and this, this question here is, what part of the watchmaking process is still the trickiest for you? I don't really know an answer to that one. I, <laughs> I would say that, and I, this might be off topic for that question, but the biggest challenge I have is finding information because there's, there are not many peers in the watch industry here in the US that actually make parts and design parts. Most of that still takes place overseas. So when I have a question, I can't necessarily talk to somebody who is geographically nearby. Uh, and oftentimes that means language barriers. And that can be very tricky, uh, dealing with those language barriers and also not only language barriers, but tooling is different. The machines I use, a lot of them come from Europe. And Getting information about certain machines can be very tricky. It's, it would be like seeing a screw in a wall and seeing that little pattern, right? The little plus sign and not knowing what tool does that, right? And not knowing that there's a screwdriver you could just buy to turn that screw. 
So having to figure all of this out and make your own screwdriver is a big challenge here in the US. Now this question could go many different ways. It is what percentage of your watch parts are made in-house? Percentage is kind of tricky to talk about because of the fact you have a lot of pieces, right? And if we're just doing part count, it's about 90, 95% of the parts in our US made caliber 1003 are made here in my workshop. But I don't necessarily think that that's a totally honest representation of the challenge uh, because you also have certain parts that are way more complex to produce than other parts. Um, so if they were, if one part was 1% and another part was 1%, one could be much more challenging to produce than the other. So I try to stay away from describing any of our watches as a, a percent of how much we do here. What's the best advice you can give to become successful in independent watchmaking? I wish somebody had told me that. <laughs> the best advice I could give to someone who's looking to be successful as an independent watchmaker, I would say, make sure you understand that there's very little new in watchmaking, right? We're taking old people's inventions. We're taking old people's discoveries, right? There are some amazing watchmakers from the past three, 400 years that have developed what is now the mechanical watch. And we're just reusing their ideas and their designs. So making sure that you're honest with yourself and others about that and very humble, that helps a lot because that allows the watchmaker to focus on their own artistic interpretations without having to worry about trying to be first at something or create something completely new because that's not really what classic watchmaking is about. It's about keeping the history alive and the knowledge alive. All right, so this is one, if I was talking to my younger self, it says, tell your younger self what to focus on more when it comes to learning watchmaking. I think one thing I wish I had spent more time on while I was in watchmaking school would be the reverse engineering of watch parts for restoration. It's very challenging to take a working system and remove one or two parts and get rid of them. And then to look at what's left and figure out what you have to make, what those parts need to be shaped like in order to fit back into that system. And I wish I had known that earlier and focused more on that because being around watchmakers while you're in school, it's a huge resource. So if you have a question, you can go to the older watchmakers and ask them. And if they don't know the answer, they've been doing it much longer and have an even bigger network of other watchmakers that they could ask. So just trying to learn more about restoration and individual component designs and how to kind of 
work backwards. All right, and this next question is asking for advice for a student that's entering watchmaking school uh, at the Lidditz Watchmaking School here in Pennsylvania, and they have no prior experience. Well, to be honest, I think that's the best way to go into watchmaking school is with no prior experience. Uh, it means you will not have formed any bad habits, so you'll be able to go in with an open mind. So I think that's very important. I really think that uh, with watchmaking school, you get out what you put in. And so if you can spend as much time as possible using the, the lathes, the milling machines, all of the special fancy tools that are at your disposal while you're at watchmaking school, if you can use that and also pair it with all of these experienced watchmakers that you have around you, the more time and the more questions you can ask, that's really on you. You'll learn the basics, but beyond that, it's up to you to ask the questions and to show the interest. I think a good video discussing high versus low hertz or, or beat rate uh, watches would be popular. Just an idea. <laughs> I think there's a lot of confusion and just general unknowns about high versus low beat rate watches. An interesting, I think something interesting about high versus low beat is the 18,000 beats per hour is what would be considered a traditional beat rate. That means you'll see that with a lot of traditional complications, tourbillons, perpetual calendars, uh, minute repeaters, a lot of grand complications, very complicated watches will have a beat rate of 18,000 beats per hour. And for one, that is because these movements were made back when beat rates were 18,000 beats per hour. The other reason though, is that it's kind of an ideal beat rate to have a smooth sweep of the second hand and also a nice power reserve. When you start increasing your beat rate, you will decrease your power reserve. A high beat rate can potentially lead to a more accurate watch, but that's only if the components are manufactured to a very high standard and the watch has been properly oiled. And also if your escapement is properly fitted and properly regulated. Another thing that you have to think about in terms of high beat rate movements is that all of the parts in the watch are moving faster. So I talked about lubrication earlier and how long lubrication will last in a watch. Well, if you double the speed at which all of your wheels are turning, you will increase the amount of friction and the amount of wear and the amount of metal dust particles that are produced. So even if you do end up with a more accurate timepiece, it might only be a few seconds a day more accurate than a standard beat rate, but it could potentially require twice as much service. It's similar to a car engine with high revolutions, right? High revs, it's gonna mean more engine wear and 
more frequent service intervals. So there's definitely a balance in the high versus low beat rate. So here's a question asking if I could elaborate on my assembly process for our standard issue field watch. So our standard issue field watch uses a mix of parts made here in this workshop, parts made in other workshops in the US, and also other components that come from Switzerland. So all of these components are delivered here or made here. They all come together in this workshop in Nashville. And I do assembly on a batch level. They're pretty small batches, usually about 10 watches at a time, where I will work through movement assembly. Once I have 10 movements assembled, then I'll switch to something else. It could be the dial and hand assembly on there, uh, or it would be finishing and assembly of watch cases. So even cases need assembly. After they've been polished, we have to press fit crystals with gaskets. We have to press fit tubes for the crowns. Everything that makes a, a case watertight, that's all done in pre-assembly. The movements of the standard issue don't require me to do things like jewel setting or uh, riveting of wheels to pinions, things like that. That's done in Switzerland for those components. But all of the assembly of the rest of the components happens here in Nashville. And once I have a stack of 10 movements and a set of 10 cases, uh, a set of 10 dials and 10 sets of hands, all laid out and ready for the final assembly. I can do that at my workbench. That's when I would do the final regulation of the movements, setting of hands and the dial on the movement and case up, which is a very slow, meticulous process because we have to be very careful not to get any dust particles inside the case. And of course, the final step would be quality control, making sure that the watch case is watertight, making sure that the timing is still within tolerance, uh, even after the watch case has been closed and anything might shift and then, of course, testing of the power reserve and the winding, making sure that there are no timing issues while it's on the winder for a couple of days. So there's a lot to the assembly process. I have a question here about our 10 year anniversary, which is this year. Uh, and it's uh, asking, what's up your sleeve? for our anniversary. Will there only be 10? I'm assuming that uh, this person is asking about a possible limited edition of 10 pieces for our 10 year anniversary. And I can't really give out any details about that, but I think they might be on, on the right track. So the final question here is, do you have a favorite everyday watch? And I do. I have a 38 millimeter standard issue field watch, the automatic version, which I wear pretty much every day. Black dial, green strap. I like the canvas strap in the winter. And then when it gets really hot here in Nashville, I like to switch to the, the green rubber strap. Thanks for watching the Watchmakers Workshop. I have a lot of things planned, a lot of great episodes coming up, and a lot of new things that we're gonna try out. I plan to do more of these episodes uh, in the future, and if you follow along on Instagram with 
Weiss Watch Company, or my personal account, Cameron M. Weiss. You'll be able to see when we're asking for questions, and then you can get your answers on video with the Watchmakers Workshop. So make sure you subscribe and tell anyone you think who might be interested in watches and watching our show to hop on YouTube and take a look and subscribe. Mm -hmm.